Hey, um, my name is Danielle Lantain. I'm an associate professor at Tufts University. I'm going to talk about some of the research, uh, a, a number of different research projects we're doing, not going in depth on one, but we do quite a bit of work around WASH and outbreak response. Um, I want to start with the evidence base and essentially say we got into this work when we, with um, Humanitarian Evidence Program and 3IE funding did a systematic review of 15,000 documents looking at outcomes and impacts in gray lit and in, um, and in published lit. And we found that the evidence base for WASH and outbreaks is pretty thin. We have quite a bit of evidence at the top right here around chlorine tablets. We know how they work, if they work, if you want to run a program, how do you do it? Um, so we have quite a bit of evidence um, around chlorine tablets, but there's low evidence in hygiene sanitation. There's low evidence in interventions that are generally done only in emergencies. And there's a set at the bottom in which there was no published, either in the gray lit or the um, published lit, no evidence. And I, I kind of called these commonly implemented but severely under-researched. And these are things like water trucking, um, well rehab, bucket chlorination, household spraying to prevent transmission. These are things that are really commonly done. So over about the past three years, um, we've really been focusing in my lab group on filling these gaps. So what we're currently researching in the lab group is um, we divide our work into lab, field, and policy. So our um, lab work, we're looking at the efficacy of bucket chlorination. We're looking at when you have vibrio cholera in waters with different turbidities, different um, organic material demands, et cetera, and you add V cholera, how much chlorine do you need to add to, to inactivate to get what log reduction of V cholera? We're looking at the same thing with different surfaces. So we know a lot about how things are removed when you clean stainless steel because that's US hospitals. But we're looking at um, what if you have foam or wood or tarp, things that are used in cholera treatment centers or in homes. You put cholera on top of that, and then you spray or wipe chlorine. How is that removed in the lab setting? We're looking at uh, kind of con deliberately contaminating with biofilms, jerry cans, and taps. And um, then cleaning them with different cleaning methods to see how to remove biofilms and keep those storage containers clean. And we're looking at um, deliberately fouling. We've done some field work. Um, and we found fouling in membrane filters like the Sawyer and Life Straw. But we're looking at doing it in the lab setting, deliberately fouling to understand how that fouling happens. Um, it's funded. These are funded. The donors are next to it. So it's R2HC, Ofta, Kohler, Tufts internal funding. In the field, we're going into the field. We're not running randomized control trials like Christine presented. We're doing effectiveness of programs that are being done by implementers. So we're working with a number of you to evaluate programs. We're looking at water chucking, bucket chlorination, household spraying and household disinfection kits, hygiene kits, cash transfers, and shared latrines. That's with a variety of donors and a variety of contexts. Um, in policy work, we're looking at um, developing a guidance document. Many of you are on that committee as well, looking at how to select and align a chlorine tablet for a particular context and at the impacts of coordination and quality and response. So as you can see, we don't do the kind of randomized control trial that Christine uh, Marie so brilliantly just presented. We do a mix of kind of lab, field, and policy work to get at pieces of it. But it, I think it, pulling those pieces together is, is where I think the next step is, and I'll get that at the end. I'm not going to talk about all of these today, but I'm going to talk about some of the, um, some of the more interesting results we have to, to show what we're doing. OK, so this is uh, what we currently have running in the lab. It's a, it's a lab setup. And so we have a pump at the bottom that you can't see, but it's pumping um, a LB broth solution spiked with E. coli through these top containers. You can see in the middle there, um, there's taps. There's eight taps on each of these containers, and then running in the bottom, and then it's continuously circulating. We change out the E. coli every day for five days, and we grow biofilms in these taps, right? We know we have biofilms. We image them. These are an image of the biofilms we get. And then at the end, we destruct the taps, and we, um, we do various cleaning methods. So we, we're trying to clean with things users might have access to, vinegar, soapy water, sodium hypochlorite. Um, and one more that I'm going to forget when I'm on the podium, uh, boiled water, actually. 
And so we clean these taps and then we destruct them and image them. And so this is an example of some of our results and I think this is um, showing us some unexpected and interesting findings. On the left is the biofilm after you s kind of wipe it or, or scrub it with boiled water. What you can see is you haven't killed any of the E. coli, you haven't killed any of those green, um, the, the bright green things or e. coli, individual E. coli. You've just spread them around in the direction you scrubbed. Does that make sense? On the right is when you soak it in boiled water for five minutes. There's no E. coli, they're gone, the biofilm's dead. So one of these things is these simple cleaning methods and how we recommend. We know that taps grow biofilms in them, and as you take water out of the tap from the safe storage container, you can recontaminate it. We've seen that in other research. We're trying to figure out methods to clean. We're, we also have similar results from jerry cans. We're, we've done boiled water and vinegar, but we need, we're actually yesterday they did the destruct day for, um, for sodium hypochlorite, and we'll do soapy water, and we'll get all this um, published and out, but these are kind of simple recommendations, right? It's a, a lot of what our lab group does is these higher tech kind of engineering -y type things, microscopy, et cetera, to answer simple field questions. Um, in our field work, we tend to do mixed methods protocols. We don't do what Christine Marie presented, which is randomized control trials. We're more looking at mixed methods protocols to evaluate existing programs. So we have household spraying. We'll do um, key informant interviews with field program coordinators, with the sprayers. We'll do observations. We'll test the spraying solution. And then we do household surveys and surfaces of the beneficiaries. I have some results um, to present on household spraying. The debate with household spraying is whether or not it works, right? That's the first debate, which is you spray chlorine on household surfaces of the of the families of cholera patients, like Christine Marie was talking about, to try and um, prevent that interfamilial transmission, right? So what we did, and these are two different programs, top and bottom, we looked, we swabbed the surfaces of the household before spraying. That's on the left, before. We did five households in each context. We swabbed surfaces of the households and we tested for where the cholera was. More cholera is orange, no cholera is blue. As you can see, in both contexts, there was a lot of cholera in the kitchen, the inside floor of the kitchen, the latrine floor, patient's bed pops up in one context but not the other, but you can see there's places in the house where there's more cholera on the surfaces. In the top program, you see 30 minutes after spraying, it all goes blue. The spraying actually reduced the V cholera on the surfaces. 24 hours later, we also went back. You see a little bit pop up in the kitchen, right? Okay, bottom program, you don't see that. You see the orange is before and 30 minutes and 24 hours afterward. What's the difference? The top program, the sprayer went in, had five liters of chlorine solution, had a systematic way of spraying, started at the bed, went in circles, went to the latrine, sprayed until every surface was wet with chlorine. Bottom program, less than two liters of chlorine per house, no systematic way of spraying, right? implementation matters and, and the sense of whether or not it works. We've done this in Haiti. We'll do another one in Haiti. We're seeing more results. Now, this just shows that household spraying has the potential to remove cholera from the surfaces. It doesn't show what percent of transmission comes from the surfaces, and it doesn't show whether or not this reduces disease, which is what Christine Marie's randomized control research can do. So it shows that there's potential, but there's real concerns. How fast do you get to the household? How much of the root is this? So it adds to the evidence base of household spraying, but there's more work to be done. In bucket chlorination, we did a similar protocol with bucket chlorination, uh, commonly implemented in cholera. Um, at first, we started with observation of chlorination points. right? So as you go from the left to the right on the graph, um, this is one, uh, this is four different countries, so each color in the graph is a different country, a different implementation program. Um, and as you go from left to right across the graph, every country, all ten of the points we looked at in each country, had equipment to dose, okay? Most people had log book books. Some people had um, the equipment necessary to manufacture and make the chlorine. Whether or not they had umbrellas or shade to protect the workers and the chlorine, that started to vary. Whether or not there was appropriate PPE for the workers, that started to vary. And then only one country had uh, FCR test equipment. So you see that's what's there. 
And then you see when they make the chlorine solution, all four programs had a goal of making 1% chlorine solution. We looked at 10 programs in each. The average was varied from between 0.18 and 3. They're, they're not making 1% chlorine solution. You can see the min and the max in the program. We had one site in, um, in a program in DRC that was 7.2% chlorine. Right? So the chlorine solution that's being made to dose at bucket chlorination is varying widely. right? Uh, and so it's kind of messy here. Perfect. But then I want to show this. This is your E. coli in the household thir um, an hour after dosing in this case. And what I want to show you is E. coli in the household in these programs, even with the dosing such a mess, almost all the samples are less than 10, which is low risk, or and a, a majority of them in two programs were, um, were less than one, which meets the World Health Standard. And I want to highlight the orange country, which is where you see a lot in the 1 to 10, 100 to 1,000, and greater than 1,000, is where you had the 0.18 chlorine solution. You just weren't adding enough chlorine. So there's a lot of mess here, but you saw E. coli reduction in the waters. So there's about, this is about like how can we get the chlorine made better? How can we get PPE? How can we get shade? Again, these implementation factors, right? Um, so some of the, the next steps that as we're kind of doing all this research is what does it all mean? And, and this is kind of where I'm thinking and where I'm, I, I want to put things together. One is what are these really critical factors for success? Um, out of this research and, and what we'll look for is some real simple like to clean a tap, put it in boiled water for five minutes. Don't scrub it. Does that make sense? Those are some real simple policy recommendations. Um, but I want to really think about how you put these individual interventions together in a wash package. Like would you, for example, put is there any reason would there be to put household spraying with distribution of chlorine tablets and hand washing education? What is this targeted wash package to prevent cholera transmission? And I'm really kind of, as throughout the meeting, I've been thinking about a lot of things. And, and I've worked on or worked with people who do other eradication programs, like guinea worm eradication, polio eradication. And there's a laser focus on eradication. You care about guinea worm and absolutely nothing else. You don't care about, you know, guinea, a good example is guinea worm. I worked with Eric Mintz for eight years. With guinea worm, they give a, a filter to put on the household water. And guinea worm's huge, so that filter's 10 microns. They could easily make that filter two microns and get rid of crypto and giardia as well. When we talk to them about that, they're like, no, we're not talking about that. We're talking about guinea worm only. And I think there's a tension between the laser focus necessary for eradication and the global focus of we'd also like to have gender equity and, and get, get, um, get diarrhea gone and have all these long-term wash programs. And I think in the discussions I've heard, we're not sure where we're at. Are we doing all long-term wash? Or are we doing laser focus eradication? Are we working in the middle? And I think there's a real point to think about where are these cholera response packages to target loss of, trans to prevent transmission, what do you have to do with those households for transmission? And then how do we also link that to the longer water programs? And of these ones that actually work, where's the health impact? Because that's the next step. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for keeping me on time. Thank you.